Hi everyone. <clears throat> so this is the video lecture. Um, we're going to finish up the PowerPoint on culture and then we're going to talk about what anthropologists do. So I know I mentioned this in the in the previous PowerPoint that it was a bit long so I would just finish up the end of it that I'm going to do now um, and it's just going to go along with the next PowerPoint. Okay so we are on the PowerPoint for culture and I am on slide, I think the last slide <clears throat> that we, <coughs> the last slide we were on was slide 34, so we're on slide 35 now. So we had talked about um, anthrop um, culture, subculture, the different aspects of culture, what we mean by culture and anthropology. So I, I know I mentioned this before to you guys, but you might be thinking, okay, I'm getting, I'm kind of understanding what she's saying, um, but it's still a little general, and that's fine because it's, you know, basically the first lecture of the course. So as we get into the semester and the different topics in more detail, this will be more clear. Oh, and I also want to say, so I saw um, that you all had started uh, the discussion prompt. So so as I'm recording this right now, today's uh, Monday, so I'm recording this on Monday. Now you might be watching this on Wednesday or Thursday or whenever, um, but as of Monday afternoon when I was looking at the prompts, it looks as if at least 10 people have started that <clears throat> so that's great and you guys have until the second that sounds right it's in your powerful or it's in your syllabus anyway so but i was just gonna say like that looks great some of you didn't wait to the last minute hopefully the rest of you continue to to work on that or start that in the next day or two and so um haven't had any questions about that like i said it's it should be pretty straightforward on um, what i want you to do and it seems as if those of you who started didn't have an issue and i i was kind of reading over some of your responses i'll sit down um probably on Wednesday and Thursday and, and actually read them all and, and you know <clears throat> um, give you guys a grade for it but I was just skimming it earlier and it looked pretty good so it's kind of exciting for me as, as the instructor to see you guys engaged in the material okay anyway but the point of that was that um, like I said some of this might some of this might seem very general to you especially if this is not um, if this is like your first time ever uh, taking a class like this we will get more specific as time goes on <clears throat> okay so now slide 35 so to start today's um, so slide 35 so the top of the um, slide should say biological and cultural influences so I know I talked about this before with you that even though this is the cultural class and if you're in my bio class I've said the same thing like this is just this is the bio class but those two things are, we can op often we can never really separate them out completely now sometimes we can and I would argue that by there are plenty of biological factors that are not don't have a cultural influence, but I would say that probably for most cultural influences, there's probably a bio, or for most cultural factors, there's a biological influence. Now, I'm a biological anthropologist, so that might be my bias, um, whereas a cultural anthropologist might say the opposite of what I said. But we would, everyone would very likely agree um, that they're gonna influence each other to some degree, um, depending on what we're talking about. Uh, maybe it's going to be a small amount or a large amount, <clears throat> um, but there's definitely going to be that that interaction. And and I think we'll I think we'll talk about this a little later in the semester that there's even the argument that um, culture is just an extension of biology in like in and not like metaphorically, but in a real kind of evolutionary sense. In that, like that's a little that's a little heavier topic. Um, but just so you know, like this this is a thing in our field that there's often this this huge connection between the biological and the cultural. And many researchers or scientists would say to like, you know, extreme degrees. But anyway, we're gonna kind of just talk about some of this in, a, in, a, in an introductory sense. So, <clears throat> sorry, I'm like something in my throat all day. Like, I'm... okay, biological and cultural. Okay, so just as a as just general example. So if you look at food, so obviously if you think okay, humans as animals, we have to consume calories for energy, um, but culture is gonna dictate so many other things about that. It's gonna dictate uh, what time of the day we eat, um, <clears throat> what foods we eat, what foods are acceptable, uh, what foods are available, but what foods are acceptable in terms of like maybe there's a religious taboo or you have a personal preference um, that has like moral implications. Um, and, and that's gonna be obviously going to be uh, influenced by your culture. Um, the, the portion size um, per, per the, the slide, you can see this, the um, what foods might be eaten more rarely for special occasions. So I would ask you, like usually if we were in class, I would ask this question. Um, think of a time, like a time of the year where you eat 
specific foods that you might not eat at other times of the year. Um, and so people usually say like holidays and this is perfectly accurate. So like Thanksgiving is a really good example. So Thanksgiving, Mama's got a hairball too. You okay? She's doing her thing, okay. Um, she, you know, before I start recording, she's just like being lazy, like on the couch. It's not until she's like, who's, who's mom talking to? She starts getting all crazy. Okay. Um, what was I saying? Oh yeah. So like, so Thanksgiving, so this is a really good example. So you at Thanksgiving, now you tip like traditionally it's Turkey. Now in my house, it, we have vegan Thanksgiving. So I do like a, a vegan ham and I do, uh, I do like a vegan Turkey, um, if you're, if you're curious about any of that. So like usually people say, oh, tofurkey. Like tofurkey, I've done tofurkey. Tofurkey's all right. And it, in fact, the tofurkey ham is actually pretty good. There are so many other brands, like it, this is a total side note, but there's a brand called Gardein, if you were ever curious. And a lot of people like, like to eat vegan stuff just for health reasons, like on occasion. So if you were like, hmm, I'd like to try it just to kind of see, the brand Gardein is a really good brand. You can get it like at Target, Smith's. It's really easy um, to get. And uh, I remember the holidays, they have a holiday roast that's pretty good. Um, but then I do like all the traditional stuff, you know, uh, mashed potatoes and gravy, stuffing, you know, I bake, I bake like a pot, a couple pot, I bake a lot. I, I love Thanksgiving. Anyway, but so you, you might eat turkey occasionally, maybe a couple times throughout the year, but for a lot of people, it's usually just that one time of year. Um, or, or maybe at Christmas you might eat it as well. It's typically like, like the full on turkey with all of the, you know, the stuff, it's something we kind of reserve for that time of the year. Now, it wouldn't be super uncommon to have it at another time. Maybe turkey happens to be your favorite food and you eat it all the time. Like in terms of like making the big turkey, like sure you might get like turkey, like, you know, cold cuts or something, that's different. Um, <clears throat> but even at Christmas too, so you might think, oh, you know, like maybe gingerbread cookies are like a Christmas time or holiday time thing, pumpkin pie. Um, but then what about like even birthdays? So like birthday cake, or maybe if there's a specific type of cake that you only you know make, or maybe your mom or something makes for you on your birthday. Um, so we can, we can go on and on. Like there are certain celebrations, certain times of the year where we might have certain things that we kind of reserve for that particular time. In fact, let me think, there's probably something I'm putting on straight away. And my mind just popped up like green, green on St. Patrick's Day. Like people dye like the beer green. And like there's certain, that would be weird to have that happen not on St. Patrick's Day. So we, you know, we can think of like so many examples. Um, so that, that, but that's a cultural like influence. That's not biology. That's not instinctual. I need to eat turkey on this. Day. Like that's all cultural. That, like I said, biologically you have to consume food, but culture is going to dictate all those other factors. So if you look from, you know, population to population, you're going to see, oh, I see they eat, you know, instead of being three meals a day, they eat, you know, five smaller portions a day, or, you know, they, this particular group doesn't eat this one food because it's, you know, it's against their religion. Um, this particular group, their portion sizes are much larger, um, and this other group, they're smaller. Like, so, so all those other factors on top of the fact that you have to consume calories, everything else, that's a cultural influence on, on the biology. And then we see, because of that cultural influence, biological uh, consequences and repercussions when you have a population that's consuming, like, let's say, high proportions or high, high, larger portions of food and a lot of maybe processed or fast food. What you're going to see is an increase in certain diseases, you know, high, higher cholesterol, heart attacks because of that. So then it's like biology, culture, biology, like they're, you know, affecting each other. <clears throat> okay, slide 36. So uh, I know I mentioned this one before when we were talking. So like beauty standards um, or standards of like attractiveness, these are going to be different from, from culture to culture. And this is an interesting take on like the biology and the cultural influences on each other. I'm so sorry, my throat is so dry. Okay, so obviously we can look at our faces and from culture to culture, we can say obviously we all look kind of similar, we're all primates, we're all the same species, homo sapien, generally, generally the same facial structure. Um, but what we do to our faces and what we perceive as beautiful, how we, how we um, alter them or don't alter them, is going to be different from culture to culture. And I think, oh, this is a good one. So I have some examples of this. Okay, so slide 37. Um, body hair, body hair on women specifically. So obviously you are all, I'm assuming most of you are adults every once in a while, I get a, like a, someone who's not 18, but I'm going to make the assumption that most of you are adults in this class or close to, you are all aware that humans 
uh, we have hair on our bodies. Um, now, because humans are a sexually dimorphic species, basically what that means is that there are um, several phys physical, physiological, anatomical, morphological, hormonal differences between males and females. Um, so we recognize that in general, males tend to have more body hair um, than females as a group. Um, and that's gonna be like culture specific, but this is true. But <clears throat> we recognize that females obviously grow body hair in the same areas that men do. Um, typically it's, it's less, um, but it's still absolutely there. So per this picture, here's this woman with this, you know, what I think is like just the uh, most adorable like <laughs> armpit hair. Um, but when I've shown this to my classes before, usually the reaction's like, oh, that's weird, that's gross. Um, now I would say, I, I feel like this is a, a, a trend that's not like, it, it's definitely, I see, it's more prominent now. Um, so maybe you, as you're watching this video, you're like, I didn't have that reaction. I think it's like, whatever, I don't care. I feel, I feel neutral or I like it or whatever. Um, but when you start thinking about this in terms of like, you know, biology and culture, um, it's, it's a cultural expectation that women are supposed to shave well, you know, we can have a whole discussion on that. In fact, when we talk about like gender roles later in the semester, we'll talk about this in great detail. Um, but what are the gendered expectations um, and rules imposed on, on, on women in, for this particular thing? For body hair, often it's considered weird if you don't remove it all, which when you really start to think about it, it's like, this is the natural state of my body, or for any woman, it's the natural state of their body to have hair in different areas, just like it is for men. Um, but more so than, uh, than men, it is for women that there's this cultural expectation, this social expectation that you need to re remove all that hair or you're, it's seen as unattractive um, or unhygienic, which the whole reason we have body hair evolutionarily is because it helps us be more hygienic. Um, I mean, there's some nuance to that discussion, but so like when you think about it, you're like, this is a natural state of my body, um, but culturally I have to like do all these things um, to, to meet this, 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 cultural standard, you know, and then of course we're going to see differences from culture to culture where that might not be true. Like body hair is like no big deal. Um, and, uh, removing it, maybe only done at a certain time. Like, so there's going to be a lot of variation in that as well. Okay. So slide 38. So you see, um, some manipulation of the body. So the name of this population is escaping me right now. Um, but I, there's actually a really good documentary on this group, but so you probably have seen this before. Maybe you're more familiar with it. Um, some of you might not be, but you've seen probably like these rings that they wear and often the, the misconception is that it's stretching their neck. It's not stretching their neck. It's actually like pushing down their, their clavicle. Um, so it pushes that down and, but it creates this like, you know, uh, visual that it's elongated. And so for them, this is, this appearance is very, it's considered, you know, very attractive. It's the standard of beauty. There's a whole really interesting, like, um, practice involving like how this, how you get your first few rings and how you clean them and all this other stuff. Um, but this would absolutely be like a, a an interesting, um, what's the word I'm thinking of? An interesting, you know, um, I'm blanking on words today, not combination, contrast between, you know, the biological and the cultural that now there's this extreme manipulation of the, of the biological, the anatomical, because of this cultural influence that can have biological implications later um, for these women if, you know, it might cause uh, some, some issues. Now, I've heard some misconceptions like, oh, like they take the rings off and they can't hold their head up or something. Like that's not accurate. Um, but you can imagine when you, when you manipulate your, your body in, the, in this way or in other ways, whenever you manipulate your body in extreme ways, there's always the, the chance for something to, um, you know, go awry. Okay, so slide 39. So this is more of like a Western example. And then you might be looking at this picture and thinking, why does she have a picture of dolls? Those are not dolls. Those are real human females um, who have a lot of plastic surgery and cosmetics. Um, to, to so much to the point uh, that they look like, they don't even look like real. They look like uh, maybe an animation or, um, What's the word I'm thinking of? Like robots or something, I don't know. Um, and that might be like in their subculture might be, they might be considered like the most beautiful. And like when you pick it apart, like as you know, as an academic, you're like, oh, I see, you know, certain things, their eyes are very large, the breasts are larger. Like I can see how, like, I don't agree, but I could see how like, you know, uh, just like we talked about before about a lot of stuff being functional. Um, but this is, you know, kind of an extreme. 
So, but it's interesting to think of like in terms of like how culturally we manipulate the body in so many uh, ways. Okay, so slide 40. So this is a good one. Because it's often easy for us, like in, in a Western culture, um, or even in, even in like the US or Las Vegas, to be like, re recall we talked about this, trying to eliminate that ethnocentric view. Um, that we think, okay, yeah, other cultures do like weird things, but like our way is normal. We do it the normal way. That's not, that's not how it works. So you have to kind of turn that you know lens inward and look at yourself and your own culture to see like oh we do some weird stuff too um so high heels so now this picture that i have here is an extreme example these are four or five inch heels those are very high heels um high high heels okay you guys know what i meant but um i, I think most most of you are probably well most most of the females are probably aware that especially now because we have like long-term data on this that um Wearing high heels, I think it's like anything over an inch or like an inch and a half can cause, if you wear it more than like so many times a week or something, can cause major problems later in life with your your hips, your knees, your back. Like, this is no surprise. Um, but we understand that it actually, um, it, it's considered, like wearing them for many women um, makes us, there's a standard that that makes us more attractive. One, it makes us taller. Um, which can often have the appearance, especially if you're shorter, maybe you want to be taller just in general. But it gives you the appearance that your legs are longer. It also, like, when the heels are really high like this, it actually, like, lifts your butt, so it makes you look like you have more curve to you than you might not, maybe don't have if you didn't have the heels on. So it really changes how you look. Um, and then, of course, because you look taller, but everything else is the same size, you look, your waist and everything looks smaller in proportion to the rest of your body because you look taller. Um, sorry, i got to readjust. Okay, so, but obviously, like, there are some, some major, you know, health implications to this. And, and even in the immediate, like, just wearing heels can be very uncomfortable because you're putting more weight on a part of your foot that you're not supposed to. When we think about humans as bipeds, the reason we have, like, the type of foot we have and the arch support that we have is because we're bipedal. Because all of our weight is on two limbs rather than four limbs. But now you throw in high heels and you're, like, just on part of, like, you know, what is it, like, the ball of your foot. Um you become very unstable and especially when the heel is that high. Now, if you're wearing like a one, one and a half, maybe even two inch heel, probably not going to be a problem, but some of these extremes. And of course, probably for most of us, I would assume uh, living in Vegas, we probably see a wide variety of types of shoes like this, you know? And, and of course, like you got, like I told you already, you know, I'm a fashion major. So from an artistic side, I'm like, Oh, this is really cool and interesting. But then when you pick it apart, like academically, it's like, this is, or from the feminist uh, critical perspective, it's like, okay, this might be an issue. Um, and this, you know, to kind of go along with this slide 41, so in, in other cultures there are similar things, you know, with the foot. So most of you are probably familiar with this with foot binding, um, but the foot to have a very particular shape was considered the standard of beauty, this very, very specific shape, and you can see this in the picture, but severe manipulation, basically uh, starting at childhood, to bind the feet to make them look a certain way. But if you see this, so there's three pictures on the PowerPoint. The one on the left where she's pointing to her foot. You can see how the toes are wrapped around. Like, the, to me, this is like, I feel it like in my feet. Like, whew. So this might be one of those things. So we talked about this before about um, cultural relativism. How we might say, okay, sure, other cultures do things in different ways. And it's not better or worse or right or wrong. But there might still be a couple of things that you're like, I just don't know if I can get past like this one thing or this other thing. And th for some people, this is the thing. They're like, you know, I get it. But there's a point where you, these women, and it's the women, of course, so that's part of the issue, um, are not mobile. Like, how is this, this seems problematic in, in just like functional terms, but also it seems like sexist and like there are a lot of other issues. So this might be the one thing for you. You're like, look, I get it for the most part, but, but this is the one thing that really, I don't know if I could still have that relativistic perspective on that. And like I said before, that's legitimate. Like, um, it's, it's, it's definitely, um, a, oh, what's the word? Oh my God, our words today, right? It's definitely, a, I'm gonna say a thing, but I, I need a better word than thing, but it's definitely a thing amongst anthropologists that they would say, like, this is still like a current, like discussion and an argument that goes back and forth about, is there a point where you have to draw a line, you know, like the ethical consideration. Okay. Um, slide 42. Okay, so culture is adaptive, and I have in parentheses maladaptive, but I want to be cautious with this word. But basically, 
So just to give you a little bit of background, so we, um, and we'll talk about this in a little more detail when we talk about the biological anthropology. And if you're taking that course with me, you know we talk about this at great length. Um, but when I use the word adaptive, basically what that means, in any given environment, um, certain traits that you have are going to be more beneficial given that trait and given that environment. That trait in another environment might not be beneficial, but in this particular environment it is. And someone else might have another trait that isn't as beneficial. So that's like a very general kind of uh, definition of that. So biologically, so you can look at this picture, um, I'm demonstrating this like in an area, in an environment, environment where there's a lot of snow, having white fur or hair might be beneficial. Um, for the for like for example for these small rabbits because hopefully you're thinking it in your head right now because predators are going to be less likely to see them they'll be able to hide better um, also their their hair for depending on the animal um, in cold environments it's going to be thicker for warmth so this makes sense to you guys right and if you see the other picture it's the desert hair it's brown because same thing it's going to be more likely to be able to hide camouflage a little bit so these are some very you know um, um, uh, basic explanations of adaptation. But this is also true for, for culture. Um, so moving on, I'll, I have some examples of this. So slide 43. Um, so this, so we can, we can alter our, our environments with culture. So we, what's a good example? So like if we were, I mean like, well the rabbits for example, in contrast to them, humans who live in cold environments we might, in contrast to those who don't live in cold environments, we might have more body hair, but that's not really how we stay warm because we have this more cultural, complex experience that's outside of the biological. We can interact with our environment in more complex, complex ways. So we can create a fire. We can um, create clothing, whether that's from you know like some plants or from an animal skin. We have the ability to get warm in different ways versus just like waiting for generation and generation to like change the hair hair growth on our body. Hopefully that makes sense to you. So culture is really good at, we are really good at addressing um, with our cultural experience, um, um, the things that we can create in our environment um, to mitigate some of those environmental factors. So here you can see the picture, there's the woman, you know, she might live in, you know, Alaska, but she's got this nice home, shelter, nice fire, she's like drinking her wine, you know. Um, but also even, even on larger scales, so you can see the other picture, it's a dam. So now we can manipulate like huge portions of like the landscape to our benefit. We have this ability. But sometimes, and this is the point of the next slide, slide 44, <clears throat> sometimes we can get to the point where the things that we have done culturally to manipulate our environment that might have been beneficial initially can become problematic. And this is what I mean by maladaptive. Um, sometimes things can become problematic in a certain way. Now usually we're really good, whether it's biological or, or cultural we're really good at like kind of self-correcting um either we are culturally or or you know natural selection does it you know in, in biologically but so if you look at this picture um you can see the the cars and traffic with all the smog now initially this it was a, a really great adaptation for for humans to be able to travel um to work obviously like on the daily um as, as in a daily example but also like think about when you're traveling to like other countries or across the country um, how hard would that have been if you had only like to walk or maybe bicycles or a horse like the fact that we have like globalized travel whether it's cars or you know trains or automobile uh, airplanes boats like um, it makes traveling so much easier and it completely changed the dynamic of how we interact culturally and biologically so it's, that's very interesting but so very advantageous for us um, culturally, uh, socially, economically, to have different modes of transportation. Um, but then problems with it because of, you know, the smog, which can cause, you know, environmental issues, major health concerns. You can see the other picture to the side, health concerns, depending on which, if you live in a major metropolitan city. Um, but like I said, we're really good at self-correcting. So if you look at slide 45, you'll see, and then of course, culturally, we are now recognizing that and starting to adjust the items that we're making um, to still have the advantage, but without the problem. Um, so you can see now we have a lot of, um, where am I blanking? Electric vehicles. I remember, you guys have kind of young. I remember when the Prius first came out, like, when was that? Like 2000, like five, 
five or something. Maybe it was before that, but I remember it was like, oh my God. And now you see them all the time. Now, like even on campus, they have like the areas where you can like hook up your electric vehicle. And, and I, well, even back then the Prius was only like half electric or whatever. Now they have like fully electric vehicles. And now we're gonna, I in the next 10 years, we're gonna see some huge um, technological advances, I think in this, we're already seeing them now, but so very interesting. And let's move on. Um, I, I think I already said this before, but these next couple of slides. Okay, so slides 46, culture is integrated. So whether, so you can see the little, the little picture, but if you're thinking about one particular group of people and you think of like, okay, what are the, what do I have on that thing? Uh, like the art, the art or the government or the family structure or the education or the religion, like all of those things are gonna be tied in certain ways. So I have an example of this on the next slide. Okay, so um, obviously the type of government you have is going to is can be influenced by or be or influence be an influence on the religion. Um, so here we have Iran, and this is like the 1970s, and you can see it on the on the uh, the left, and then it, only a few years later, because of the religion and mixing with the government, a huge cultural shift um, for the individuals who lived in Iran. Um, and then the second, the second example, um, the type of art might be influ influenced by technology. So we're always going to see artistic expression in any culture. Um, but if all you have is the ability to shape clay, you're going to come up with some really amazing art. But then suddenly if you have a computer, for this example, the type, the type of art, now not better or worse necessarily, but different, more, more variation, we're going to see that the, all those things are going to be um, integrated with each other and then uh, slide 48 so cultural changes and this is kind of the point of what I was making with the last point changes constantly occurring um, no culture is going to be the same or static for any long period of time maybe certain aspects will but typically you're going to see some form of change so I in this example on the left I, I put this one out because this is a really interesting one for me um, cell phones, huge, huge, I mean, in so many ways, we're going to talk about this a lot in our, in this class, like so many ways have they changed our lives, as you can imagine. Now, I remember, so this is unfortunate because if we were in class, I would ask you all, um, how old were you when you got your first cell phone? So I, I remember asking my class last semester and some of them were like 12, 13, and I was like, oh my God, <laughs> I'm old. Um, cell phones weren't even, <laughs> like people had them, but it wasn't really... I would say my senior year in high school, everyone kind of started to get, everyone had like the tiny Nokias. Um, I didn't get my first phone until like right after, it was like the summer after I graduated high school. Um, I got my first cell phone. And I've been through all the, through all the iterations, like the, the tiny little ones, the slider, the flip. Oh, I had some cute like pink flip phones. And then, and then I got my first smartphone, you know, which that was, even that was years ago. But, um, so I graduated high school in 2001. And so I got my first cell phone in 2001. So it's been like, it's been almost 20 years, good lord. But before then, like people didn't have them. People, I remember being like a sophomore and people still had, pay, like having a pager it was cool. Uh, you know, it's like in the late 90s. <clears throat> but um, suddenly we see this huge shift in, in just with cell phones. Now you have access to, um, you can communicate with each other, you know, text messages. I, rem I remember, literally, I remember when I sent my very first text message because I was like, wait, what? You can send a message on the phone? Like a typed message? It's crazy. <clears throat> I remember this. I was an adult when I did this. It's crazy. Um, but now, like, for most of you, I would assume it's probably like you're like, yeah, we had cell phones. Like, your parents had cell phones. You were younger. You got your own. Um, completely normal. Maybe you got, like, their hand-me-down phone or something. Um, but this is completely altered. So, I mean, oh man, I don't want to go on forever, but I could go on forever about how it has. So I'll mention two things. So one is that now the way the dynamics of like work have changed because now you're kind of always available. Like I get this a lot, like I'm at home, like I just want to, at five o'clock, I just want to like turn my phone off, but I'm like, I gotta be available for this thing with a colleague or this other meeting update. Or if you guys are emailing me, obviously, um, so because we we're kind of constantly, especially at our hands, I'm like, okay, everyone had computers, but I was at home, if you were out and up, you got your cell phone in your hand, I know you have it. And now even depending on what phone you have, they're like, I know you read that text message, why didn't you respond? So we're kind of always available, which seems like it could be a good thing, but sometimes you're like, I just wanna like, get away. I went to the river, um, 
the Colorado River. I went a couple weeks ago with some friends and we didn't have service. So I texted my mom, hey, if you just, if you happen to text me today and I don't answer, this is why I'm not gonna have service for probably like seven or eight hours. It was like the nicest thing. Like, I'm like, well, can't check my email. I don't know if anyone's messaged me. Can't do anything about it. I'm at the river. I let her, I let my work know. Like, hey, if anything comes up, I'm at the river. Like, I'm not gonna know until like four when I leave. But, and then of course when I go back into service, like ding, 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 ding. I'm like, I'm like, oh, okay. Um, but availability. But the other thing, and this one's gonna come up a lot more in this class is how it has influenced um, um, mating strategies or like in humans we say like, like dating, how has it influenced that? So now, and this is why I asked you guys on, on that PowerPoint of the first day or for the first lecture, um, how many of you have been on one of those dating apps? So like now it's like a thing, you know, like on your, you could have on your phone, like, oh, I, I might be out of touch now, but let's, let me think. So of course like Tinder, OkCupid, Plenty of Fish, Hinge, Hinge is the new one, newish one, Bumble, Grinder, and I'm sure there's like a million more, right? But now you, we, we're in this like, you're like, no, no, loser or whatever, you know. Um, and so it really, it really changes because now, and we talked about this before about the information you convey, now you have to, in one picture and maybe a few sentences, if they even read it, you have to convey enough information to be like, I'm a good potential mate, you know. Um, and of course, that's going to be different for every person, what you are looking for in a mate and what you want to represent, you know, to a potential mate. All that information is going to be differently. I am really excited to see what, what and you know what's going to happen, what research comes out of um, um, dating apps and, and evolution. Actually, there was, I read this article on that recent, like a month ago, two months ago, that someone had done one on like... Um, for, I forget which dating app it was for, maybe it was for multiple, but they looked at whether women were more, like um, for like straight, like male to female uh, couples, whether w females were more likely to swipe yes or select like a male who had a, a cat in his profile picture, like a, holding a cat, it was cats specifically. Um, I don't remember what the results were, I'd have to look it up again, but you know there are like so many like that, but it's so true, like what is the information you wanna convey, like as a man you might wanna convey I'm nurturing, I love animals, you know. As a female, you might want to convey something different. Also, your age, you might want to convey certain things if you're in your 20s versus in your 30s versus in your 40s. Oh, that's it. farmers only. Um, our time, that for the for 50 plus. I tried to get my mom on that. She's like, these are all old people. <laughs> she's in her 50s. Um, she's like, these are all old people. And so she went on plenty of fish and I was like oh mom she and I got some stories maybe later this semester I'll tell you my poor mom okay she probably doesn't want me telling you I'll have to ask her if it's okay if I put that on YouTube okay back to the science class okay but so culture is always changing uh, I'm sorry uh, yes technology is changing and that's going to drastically often um, change our cultural interactions so that like I said cell phones is a really good example okay um, and so slide 49. So what are some of the ways that technology has changed? Yeah, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so this would just be like something for you guys to think about. Um, and hopefully, I, ideally if we were in class, you know, um, I would, um, we would have a discussion. Now I'm gonna put questions like this on a lot of the PowerPoints and I can't really ask you, right? And I don't have an assignment attached to these, but because I have these throughout the semester, basically as you kind of get used to these and hopefully as I, you, you are watching this video and looking at the PowerPoint, you're taking a moment to think about it. I very likely will, on some of these, maybe a little later in the semester, say, okay, everyone, extra credit if you answer this question. Not for this one, um, but just kind of keep that in mind that I might do that later on. Um, so, you know, as an extra thing, if you're like, actually watch the videos, you're like, oh, I got to the end of the video, end of the video and she offered extra credit, so. Okay, and so then the last line, slide 50 is, Humans are not the only species with culture. Now I'm not gonna I'm not gonna watch the videos and be like and commentate on them like during this video. Um, but these are all good examples, and hopefully you get a chance to watch a couple of if not there's a, what is there five and they're only a few minutes long, just so you understand like that humans are not the only ones with culture. So I know this is part of the discussion prompt, and it was interesting to see at least the ones I kind of skimmed earlier what you guys had said. So it's gonna be very interesting once. Um, the whole class kind of starts, you know, interacting on that on that discussion thread to what you guys have to say. Um, and also I want to say, don't be afraid to write something that you think is wrong. Like, these are just discussion prompts. I'm not, I'm not grading them for, like, 
that's stupid comment. Like, I'm not going to do that. I want to know you're engaging and you have something to bring to the table. At this point, you know, because it's so early in the semester, I'm expecting you to bring your opinion. That's totally fine at this stage. Um, so, you know, don't just relax on those. But I want to say I did appreciate that it seemed as if the, the dialogue back and forth with everyone was very respectful and courteous. That was kind of cool. Okay, so now we're going to move on to what anthropologists do. So this is a really short PowerPoint. It's only like eight slides. Um, and some of this will be a little bit of a repeat, but I just wanted to have a, my own, the, a separate PowerPoint for this. Um, so this, you will, this PowerPoint is titled the same thing, What Do Anthropologists Do? So we are on slide two. So it says, hold on a second. It's like my face is like super close to the camera. Okay, plug in my computer. Okay, slide two. A lot of debate over this question, what do anthropology, especially for a cultural anthropologist, so like what is the role? Um, some would say, look, yeah, we are cultural anthropologists, but we are still science, uh, scientifically minded. We want to learn about other people. That's true, but we want to collect, you know, data, run statistics, take our bias out of it, have that very objective approach. Plenty of cultural anthropologists are like that. Um, some are not. And there was this kind of big debate about this in like the eighties. Um, but, but thinking about this idea, like if you're expecting to go live with a group of people, um, and immerse yourself in their customs and become part of their community, as many cultural anthropologists do, either for short periods of time or long periods of time, how might, how might that change how you consider the science or, or whether it is science behind those interactions? Um, so from a, just a very like superficial level, you might say, well, your, um, what's the word? Your, the fact that you're there already kind of manipulates the situation a little bit whether you want it to or not just your pr your presence your presence there already kind of adjusts things because they might act differently because a stranger is there and so you think you're getting like the, the real story and maybe you're only getting a slight variation of that a version of that so that's true but also at a deeper level and these are some of the questions people started asking like um do we have an obligation because we're dealing with like real life human people to some degree do we have any type of moral obligation to them? Do we have any financial obligation? Um, and, and, and to what degree do we have a, you know, so this is, before I get to ahead of myself, go to slide three. I already said that, sorry, I already like was thinking ahead of myself. Um, when you're living with the group, like how, do you end up feeling a sense of responsibility to them to help them? And not necessarily because of something you've done, but just because, for example, say you are, like say you work on the US, maybe you had a big grant to do research, and maybe like let's say $50,000 to do research working with a group, like a group of hunter-gatherers. And you go and you see how they're living, and you think, okay, like, obviously not, not trying to bring in any ethnocentrism, but just you might notice maybe their access to clean water might, could be better. Do you have a responsibility then to help them get that or provide that? And this is a huge debate in anthropology. Some would say you do not because you should not be interfering. You are just there to observe and collect data. That's the agreement you have with them, you know, because oftentimes these things are set up at like the government level. Like, yes, you can go stay with that group as long as they think it's okay for, you know, four weeks or whatever. Um, then that's all you're obligated to do, you know, and obviously respect them while you are there, but you don't have any further obligation. And many cultural anthropologists would say, yeah, it's easy to say that until you're there and you become part of the community and you become a member of the community, maybe at some point to some degree, and you start seeing that there are problems that you can help fix, why wouldn't you? And you, you have the moral obligation to do that. Um, huge debates, okay, so slide four. So like I said, this was this really started to be a debate in the 80s and in the 90s. Um, there were some other prominent anthropologists, but probably one of the main ones was this woman named Nancy Shepard Hughes. And she wrote a few papers about this. One of the, one of the most famous ones is this one, um, The Primacy of the Ethical. I do not expect you to read this. Um, not that you wouldn't understand it, you probably would, but it's a, it really gets into this debate. I mean, honestly, we could have a whole semester talking about just this topic. 
Um, but I, we're not going to obviously, but I want you to have, to have this idea. So this was a huge point of, um, why am I blanking on words? A huge point of conflict between anthropologists who felt differently about this. And Nancy Shepard Hughes was like, we have an obligation to help them. Um, and in this article, she goes into great detail about some very specific things. And then people were like, whoa. Because basically she's calling for, let me see if I have it listed on the next one. I don't, okay. Um, she, in this article, it's been a while since I've read it, she's calling for, um, you know, severe, uh, or I should say extreme, um, um, why, oh my God, you guys, I'm so sorry, I'm blinking. Interference in these communities. Like we have the obligation to provide them with all these things. We need to actually, get uh help them in terms of like um increasing their position of power within their communities and in their government we should be we should be using our our voices and our money to get them all these things that they need and also she would she would say that many others after this kind of like um there was this movement within anthropology that they were like we don't even need to be doing science essentially like that's not that's not our goal our goal is advocacy work now I will tell you, obviously, if you as a person in the world might say, sure, we should be helping people, um, maybe donating to charities, maybe, vol maybe volunteering, absolutely. We should, when we see someone in need as a person in the world, hopefully your reaction is to help if you can. As a scientist, that is not your role. And this is where people were like, I don't know what to do because I wanna be a good person, but I also wanna be a good scientist there's a conflict between those two things um, because that is not your role as a scientist. Now, plenty of anthropologists were like, I have to listen to my conscience. I'm gonna do this advocacy work instead and still be considered an anthropologist. And th that was the choice they made. Um, and others would say, that's so great that you did that, but that's not science anymore. And that, like, that's the only point. You should be helping people, hopefully you do. It's not science anymore. And then on top of this, and especially from this, this idea that in anthropology and cultural anthropology, we have these terms like we talked about before, ethnocentrism, cultural relativism. And so then, then, then the debate moved to, okay, you wanna help people, but who, do they want help? Are they asking you for specific help? Or are you coming in with your Western perspective and deciding what needs to be fixed in their community? Because, because this is what was happening. And so it's just like, you know, the snowball effect of like, whoa, whoa, whoa. You want to help people that's cool but now you're basically saying this is the right way to help them i think they need this even though they didn't ask and you're basically telling them this is the right way to be these are the things you need and this often these communities are like we didn't really ask for that we don't want that um that's not the way we do things and so what ended up starting out maybe with like good intentions ends up being kind of the opposite of what we teach in cultural anthropology i hope that that whole thing kind of made sense to you guys so it's a debate, it's a big debate. You still, in certain universities, will see they have an advocacy-based um, approach to uh, cultural anthropology, and, and UNLV or NCSN, you know, obviously, like, that's not the case, but I asked my, I have a, a one of the professors at UNLV, I asked her about this, she's a biocultural anthropologist, and I said, you know, what is your opinion? And she said, well, I definitely wanna have the scientific approach. She's like, but I understand what why others feel that way, and she's like, I can tell you um, after work, she's worked um, with um, the Hadza in Africa for like, I think now it's probably been like 15 years or something. And she's like, but when they need help with something, I'll help them um, if they ask me. And you know, so we, but it's just, no, it's a, it's a, it's a debate. Um, okay. I could, I'm literally thinking of like 10 more examples in my head, but I don't want to get caught up in too many tangents. Okay, so slide five. Um, Oh yeah, this is kind of just what I said. I keep getting ahead of myself with this PowerPoint, sorry. Um, so the, they would call them, so these advocacy-based anthropologists would call themselves applied anthropologists. So basically it's listed here in the PowerPoint that they would see like they have a, a goal and a responsibility to alleviate problems in these communities with in terms of like health or um, political oppression, like I said, access to certain resources, whether they are, you know, um, for food or, or other types of resources that it's their job to kind of come in and do that. 
um, versus other anthropologists would say, that's great that you're doing that, but that's not anthropology anymore. You're just volunteering. Um, but the anthropologist, the, the uh, applied anthropologist would say no, because like, they can still write an ethnography about it. So, <sighs> okay, I want to point out something about this whole debate. Slide six. I'm assuming not all of you will be familiar with this, but for some of you, hopefully this makes sense to you. Um, this is from Star Trek. It's called the Prime Directive. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but you should take the moment to read this paragraph. But basically, in, in you know, Star Trek, um, no, side note, because I keep doing that, this, this PowerPoint. Um, I grew up watching Star Trek Next Generation and Star Trek Voyager, so I loved it. And now there's like so many, and I definitely, like, there was like Deep Space Nine, which I did not watch. The original, you know, with um, William Shatner. I watched, like I didn't watch, because I wasn't, I wasn't alive when it first came out, but I watched it later. Um, but now what do they have like, what do they have like ones called Enterprise? And of course the movies that have come out, those are really good. But anyway, Prime Directive. And so if, you, if you've seen any of like the recent movies with like Chris Pine, you probably are familiar with this idea, like you're not supposed to interfere as a, as, a, as, a, as a member of Starfleet, but in anthropology, as an anthropologist, you're not supposed to interfere. Like, that's the point. Observe, collect data. Obviously, you have, you're not spying on them, you have their permission. Um, there's a whole process, like at the university and government level, you have to get permission to travel and work with a group, you know. There's that whole thing, consent, consent forms. Um, uh, but it's a similar thing, like you're not supposed, like you interfering can cause harm. Um, so you shouldn't be. So, so keep that in mind, like, that this is very similar. So if you were like, I don't understand this concept in anthropology, but I understand the prime directive, it's essentially the same thing. Okay, slide seven, ethics. So who do anthropologists have a responsibility for? Um, so like as a scientist and a researcher, you're gonna have, and this is what the bullet points show, you're gonna have a responsibility to your subjects or the people you're, wor you're working with, if you're working with Obviously, as a cultural anthropologist, you're very likely working with like live human beings um, or their information in some way. You have a responsibility to your discipline to represent your discipline in, in a good way, and you have a responsibility to your colleagues, whether that's like other professors, instructors, um, or grad students or undergrads that you might have under you working on a project or something. Slide eight. Um, so like I already said, I kind of said this, but just expanded a little bit on this. That you have a responsibility also to, if you're traveling to another country, um, to any, so that's number one. Number two, any funding that you have received. So part of often the process of research is you apply for a grant, sometimes a public or a private grant. Um, you're like, okay, I need, writing. A, I've written a grant before, um, a smaller one, but it's a process. But you have to say, you know, you explain in great detail your project, then you give a very detailed, like an Excel spreadsheet about every little thing you would need to pay for and why, why it's important and how much. And then you, you have a total. So let's just say you wrote this great grant. You're like, I need $20,000 to travel for, to live in this one place for six months and blah, 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 I need this equipment and this new stuff, whatever. Um, and let's say the grant committee is like, sounds good, do that. You have to do that. You can't just take the money. You have to do the thing you said you were gonna do. Um, so you have responsibilities, not just like blow the money. You have to take it and spit which is why you obviously keep your receipts and stuff. Um, and if you don't end up spending all the money, it depends on the grant, but sometimes they'll say, well, if it's under like a hundred bucks, like absorb it into like, you know, keep it for your lab funds or something. Um, but if it's a larger amount, typically um, you have to uh, return it. So you'll often see like in, uh, researchers like, oh, we still have like $50 left over. Let's just get extra of that thing because we have a little left over because you don't want to have to send it back if you, and maybe use it. And sometimes you don't anticipate, like, we might need extra of something, so might as well get it. Like, you never know. Anyway, but you have a responsibility to that. You can't just take the money and spend it on whatever you want. And if you decide, like, maybe your research plans fall through, like maybe there's a travel ban, you're like, oh, I can't travel, but I got $20,000 to travel to another country. You have to get the money back. Now you might, it might be written into the grant or you contact them, they're like, we're gonna give you an extension for a year, so as long as you go within the next year or whatever, then it's fine, just keep it until then. Um, but you have to, even when you're doing the research, you often have to report back in some way. And even when you're doing like, um, when you get published or if you're doing a, a talk at a conference, you have to say, my funding is by so-and-so or by this grant. So you have a responsibility to them. 
obviously, obviously number three, you have responsibility to the people you're working with in a different group. Even if it's like a subgroup in Las Vegas or you're traveling to another country, you obviously you have a, a personal ethical responsibility to treat them with respect and kindness um, and make sure that they are aware and can consent to everything that's going on. Um, obviously you have a responsibility to the communities um, and your students. So, so I'll say with this one, um, my advisor, this was maybe like three years ago, one of his colleagues in, I don't remember what university, it wasn't here, it was in, an, I mean, it wasn't in Vegas, it was somewhere else. They had gone into um, the field uh, and he took a few of his grad students and they were in an area where they knew nearby there had been some issues with some gun violence in the community, um, but not, I think, exactly where they were. And they ended up, she, this, one of the grad students ended up getting killed, she got shot. Um, um, and so that was very sad. And so you can imagine, just like in general, it's horrible, um, but that the, um, you know, um, advisor might have felt another personal responsibility in that in that sense. So, like, it can be really difficult. Um, a lot of responsibility, you know. Okay, slide nine. So then I just have some kind of questions for you to think about. Um, in terms of like your ethical responsibility. So let me pick a couple good ones. Um, mm, good one. So the fourth one down. Do you intervene if there are illegal activities? So we talked about before about you're just there to observe, but like to what degree? Like, do you abide by the laws of the where you are? You probably should, but also at, like you're supposed to just be there to observe. So what do you do? What do you like? What do you do if you saw someone like beating someone up? Well, you might be thinking, well, if it's between adults, like I'm not getting involved. But what if you saw someone hurting a child? Then you know. And also, like as as academics, often many of us, because we're like um, employees of like you know like here like Inchi, um, we're mandated reporters. So that you can imagine how that'd be a conflict. You're like, I'm just here to observe. It's really horrible, but because because maybe maybe your research is on violence. What are you supposed to do? Every time you're observing, you're supposed to report it. Some would say yes. Some would say no. Like I mean, you can see how this can become very complex and compli and complicated. Um, what else? Oh, last one, whose ethical standards are being used? So maybe you're not observing something that's illegal, but maybe you're like, I don't know, it's not technically illegal, but I feel morally uncomfortable. That's your own bias, you know. But you still might, do you, do you, do you listen to your conscience and report something or alert someone to something? Um, do you not? And then of course, then it's like, well, is it just your personal opinion, your personal morality? C could you be in trouble legally because you don't say something like you know hopefully before you start doing research you consider all of these um to the best that you can you can't predict the future obviously but but just the point of this is just to imagine that there can be so many scenarios where it can be very difficult difficult um ethically or morally or personally to to navigate okay so that's it for that um so i will see you guys on the next uh lecture